Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Event Marketing Redefined. I am your host, Matt Kleinrock, CEO of Rockway Exhibits and Events. And today, I have a very cool guest. I have Rob Drury with me from Cartwheel & Co. Marketing. Rob, welcome. Hey, man. How are you? Very, very good. Cool conversation today because you and I are in very similar spaces, but also slightly different. Experiential experiences, brand engagements, all this stuff is becoming really, really popular post-pandemic. A lot of brands are really looking to get in front of their customer, be face-to-face -face and deliver an experience. So I want to pick your brain, man. I want to talk to you about ideation. I want to talk to you about design. I want to talk to you about how to engage audiences. So let's start with what exactly do you do? What does Cartwheel do? Yeah, we are, I guess, you know, our sort of official line here is we're a, an experiential and and partnership marketing agency, but you know, the bread and butter for us is creating brand experiences mostly on the consumer side. So, you know, unlike yourself, a little bit less of that kind of trade show B2B side of things and a little bit more yep. of the consumer facing activations and initiatives that you know, essentially help spark fandom. So whether, you know, our, our ultimate end goal is driving sales or subscriptions or building brand love or affinity, sometimes it's creating, you know, general awareness, but it's using all those kind of fun, funky IRL tactics to get in front of yeah. people, to let them touch and see a product, to let them touch and see a, feel a brand, all that kind of good stuff. And then, you know, based on my background, which was at another marketing agency where I was a partner for about 19 years, I actually started and ran the TV division, which meant that we really focused on our television and media clients. So yeah. sort of hyper-focused on the entertainment space. And so as an offshoot of that, Cartwheel really, we do a, we work with a number of categories, but our kind of main focus is in the media and entertainment space. So we're doing a lot of in-world projects where we're actually bringing sh TV shows to life. You know, we're doing things at San Diego Comic-Con or South by Southwest where fans can really kind of step into the world of the TV shows, experience it, kind of get to know their brand property and the, and the shows they love a little bit more. Nice. So two things you said there that I think would be interesting to talk about. First is partnership. Right. So explain to me a little bit about you're saying experiential. You're also saying in, in the space of partnership. So explain kind of exactly what you mean by partnership and maybe some of the work that you're doing in that space. Yeah, totally. So the partnership stuff is somewhat separate. So, you know, I'd sort of say experiences and partnerships are for the most part their own kind of entities within our world, although there is a decent amount of crossover. But, you know, partnership is a pretty broad word that can mean a lot of things to a lot of people these days. When I'm saying partnerships, what I'm referring to is that we sort of have experience and, and knock on wood a little bit of an expertise in kind of connecting like minded brands with like minded audiences together to kind of co-create some sort of cultural moment or something together that hopefully the goal here is that the product is greater than the sum of its parts. So what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of the times these are barter-based partnerships because of our background in the TV space. Usually one of those partners is a TV network or a streamer around a specific show IP. And on the other side is a TBD brand. And we're kind of bringing them together to say, hey, if you guys got together, you could create a collab like a product, or you could yeah. create a pop-up together, or you could have some kind of a social media engagement. You could create a co-branded sweepstakes. Basically, it's this kind of a moment or, you know, something that we, that the two brands create together that wouldn't have been able to exist with each brand individually. And so not only are they bringing kind of their different worlds together from the brand side, but they're also, of course, sharing audiences. And I think that's kind of the big benefit on the partnership side is at sometimes for no cost, or let's say very little cost, two brands can create something where, you know, they're trading their audiences, they're trading their credibility, their brand love, et cetera. And again, they both kind of get a, a boost that, that both of them benefit from. So, you know, if somebody as at that baseline, somebody might have a social audience and another group has a social audience and boom, you put two of them together and announce yeah. this thing that you guys have done together and, and kind of everybody wins. Nice. I like that. It, it, it makes me think a little bit about on the B2B side, right? Cause that's a lot of consumer end on B2B yep. side, we're seeing a lot of, having a lot of conversations of specifically at physical events, mm -hmm. encouraging our customers to find partnerships where you share the same audience, the same customer to a degree and running, co-running events together, yep. you know, 
activations, offsite things, because, you know, two is better than one. You have the same audience, but you sell stuff completely differently. So now you're tapping into them. They're tapping into you. You can put on a better event and a partnership like that from the B2B side, I think really typically is working out well right now and will be something that we see more of. Yeah, that makes sense. I, mean, I would imagine you guys, there's also cost efficiencies, right? I mean, if you guys yep. are going into an IRL event together and there's a venue cost and you can split that mm -hmm. or somebody has a relationship that they can use as a, as a cost offset, I think that's a, that's a great way to approach it. Exactly. Yeah. So tell me, let's talk a little bit about consumer and B2B, right? I have this whole thing. I've been standing on this hill screaming about the fact that like B2B events really need to take a page out of the book from consumer events. Consumer events just do it better. I understand that consumer events, I don't want to say that they're easier, but I think that's just the simplest way to put it. They are easier when there's fan bases and audiences and people that have this affinity for large brands. Mm -hmm. And most of the times when we're talking consumer, we're talking larger brands. Tell me a little bit about what you think the consumer side does really, really well, right? And maybe how, what can people in B2B be thinking about trying to take from them in that space? Because I think, you know, people are seeing it with stuff like South by Southwest. Dreamforce is a little bit of an outlier kind of, but it's becoming kind of consumer-ish, I'd say. It's, it's yeah, yeah, you right. can almost argue yeah, yeah. it's consumer, so. Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, what the consumer side of things does best is really live in that creative big idea. I mean, that's the simplest thing, right? Everything in my world starts with a really, I mean, again, a, a big idea. What's the hook? What's different? And we're constantly being challenged for what's new and different, what's original, what's clever. I mean, clever is one of those words that you kind of find in every brief. Like they want consumers to have this kind of, oh, they did that? That's awesome reaction, right? because that's the stuff that's shareable. And, and, and these days, everything is really about that output, that social output, that digital output, the earned media output, et cetera. Like how are people amplifying these IRL experiences to reach a larger audience? So I think at its, at its core, it's really about coming up with original ways to tell stories. Cause at the end of the day, events is just another storytelling tool. Yeah. And then in addition to that, I'd say that second piece I just touched on, which is pushing out whatever you do IRL, pushing that out to through other channels so that people who didn't attend in person benefit in some way, shape or form from that experience. So I'll, I'll kind of talk for a hot second about both of those. Like on the creative side, I think as, as a kind of a breakdown of like, okay, well, if, if it's all about the big idea and starting with that big idea, what does that typically look like? I think it. some of the things is it looks like borrowing from other really creative disciplines in interesting ways. So that might be looking at the world of art, looking at the world of music, looking like just looking at the cultural world around us, looking at other countries, looking at other continents. What are some breakthrough tactics, ways to engage with people, being on the front line of emerging technology? Like, basically pushing the envelope in every possible way that we can when we come up with a big idea. And it's also very much about thinking through that big, thinking about that big idea through the lens of that ROI from the get-go. So there's kind of like, in my mind, there's the one half of it's like the cool factor, like that's kind of the clever side of it. Like, wouldn't it be awesome if, right? That all sort of falls in that world of like, hey, this is really cool. The more kind of marketing quantitative side of things is what are we trying to achieve? What, like, what output do we want here? And then what's the best way to get that? And so in our world, that usually looks like a combination of earned media. So that's literally like press coverage. That looks like social coverage from people attending on site. That looks like social coverage from people not attending on site, but they thought it was awesome enough to want to share mm -hmm. it on their, you know, with their audiences and their social worlds. Partnerships actually can be a piece of that. And that's where sometimes th there's that crossover between the events and the partnerships where you might do something and then push it out through your partner's channels. So, you know, if you've got a partner with 10 million social followers or 2 million social followers, whatever it may be, and they've agreed to help push out whatever you're doing 
right? That's like another channel that you get your message yeah. out in front of. So I think those two kind of has the whole, like starting with this really big idea and pushing yourself to do new original things. And then also making sure that you've got those channels that it can get out through. And I think of that sort of as your megaphone, like what are these different megaphones that you can speak into that have this sort of larger ripple effect? So that's kind of the a very condensed version of, of, of the playbook mm-hmm. we use in, in kind of the consumer space. I like that. I mean, it, a few things you said really resonates with me, right? Kind of what's the hook, clever, different, wow, original, like those type of things when it comes to when you are in person, when you're building a space or designing an experience, you know, like, we feel, I, I feel like we fight so hard for that in trade shows because trade shows can be so redundant. Right. Uh, I mean, you know, you're in a massive, I mean, it's as competitive as it gets. Like yeah. if you do a pop-up shop, you're probably the only pop-up shop on that street or in that area, maybe, right? So there's not a ton of competition. When you're at a trade show, you're technically a pop-up shop in a massive convention hall with 500 other exhibitors, a thousand other yeah, exhibitors. Totally, so we're- totally. Yeah. So like that line of thinking to me is something that, you know, we've pushed a ton and really resonates. Cause I think when you do see something clever, different, unique, the hook, you just know it. There's really no way of saying it. You just know, you see it. You're like, wow, okay, that's, I'm going to go over there. You just feel to go over. I think one of the things that consumer benefits from is it it's, it's just not as entrenched as B2B, right? Especially when you're talking about conferences and trade shows, like consumer marketing, consumer experiential marketing, excuse me, has been around for, call it two decades, right? And so I think that idea of like, there isn't the roadmap allows people to, enforces them to do breakthrough things. I think on the B2B side, I mean, there's been conferences going back, you know, however long, right? Forever, like 50, yeah. 70 years, right? Yeah. Dentists going to this conference or whatever. So I think that when you've got kind of a more established thing, it's harder to encourage your clients to yeah. think outside of that box, especially when they've been doing it for a long time, especially when they know it works or think they know it works. And they're not wrong, by the way. There are certain things that are tried and true that work. But, you know, I think what, what, what I would probably look at is like, this sounds so simple, but it can be really effective. Like put yourself in the shoes of the consumer, Right. You, you land in that city for this convention. There's a touch point at the airport. There's a touch point at your taxi. There's a touch point at your hotel. There's a yeah. touch point when you walk over to the convention center. And then within that convention center, there's dozens of other touch points as well. But you're absolutely correct that, you know, if you're one of hundreds, call it, of other competitors right next to each other, it, you're very much living in this sea of sameness, this kind of white noise environment. So I think that's almost an even more of a reason to try new things and to push yourself out of that kind of comfort zone. hundred percent. We saw an exhibit, my team, you know, we shared it on our team's channel. We were talking about, it was at a pet show. They had this big hanging structure in the middle of their booth and they had like a thousand blue dog leashes hanging from it down. It was pretty cool, you know, and, and it was just a good idea. It just, it drew your eye, but I like what you just said. It really got me thinking because I've, I've had this conversation with a lot of different people, right? And I've really been fascinated as to why is B2B slower in this space? And just, they're just not as cool. I mean, it's just not as cool. You know what I mean? Like, why is it so much less cool than consumer? But what you just said makes so much sense to me. And I never really thought about that. Is that like, you know, the B2B, the conference, the event, the summit. I mean, this stuff's been going on for a hundred years. So it, it is a little bit of like, this is what we do. This is the way. A lot of times we talk to our customers and we're like, why are you going to this conference? And they're like, well, we always have. Yeah. Right, on totally, the con- totally. Yeah. Right. So then they're not thinking about like, oh, oh, oh shit. We should probably drop like confetti and a bunch of playpen balls from a net out of the sky at the end of a presentation or something. Right. Like they're just not thinking yeah, in yeah, that, totally. in that, in that sense. So it's very interesting that you said that in that consumer, consumer side of things they're always trying to reinvent the wheel because there really kind of isn't a wheel, right? There's no thing that they're on the hamster where they're always trying different and unique type stuff to stand out and engage with what would be their their core audience. Yeah, I think that's true. And and I think part of the reason is that kind of ROI side of things. It's like, if you're going to be measured, if you're- That's where we're going next, by the way. That's- For example- (laughs) Yeah. then it's pretty clear you either you did something and it either worked or it didn't you can 
literally yeah. measure the metrics. So there's there's that piece of things. And, and you know, press are less likely to pick up on things that they would have written about 10 years ago because it's been there, done that. They, their yeah. job is to cover new and interesting things. So I think there's a piece of it there, but I think you said something very interesting, like, you know, as agencies, in some ways, our job is to do what our clients ask us to. And in other ways, our job is not to do that. Our job is to yeah. bring new Push ideas them. and new thinking to our clients yeah. because they're in their own bubble and they're used to doing things the same way. The same way. And, and we are that kind of breath of fresh air that brings new thinking to them. But, you know, it's very hard to change a habit right? That's just yeah. human nature. I think that's business nature. It's, you know, any, anything, right? Try to, I'm like, I tried to go to the gym this morning and I was like, damn, I got to get in the habit of going to the gym. Right. So yeah. I think that same yeah. sort of mindset and methodology or whatever just applies to like business decisions. And look at the end of the day, I think <laughs> I hate to say this, but most people are just trying to get their job done. You know what I mean? Their yeah. boss said, uh, Hey, so let's true. go to this conference. So they want to do yeah. the best version of the conference they can do, it's yeah. not necessarily in their best interest to go back to their boss and say, let's abandon a conference altogether and like try something completely different. So, you know, I think, I think at the end of the day, we kind of do what we can, we chip away where we can. And also we try to make it, at least on our side, like when we are introducing something that does feel a little different, maybe a little bit more revolutionary, like we're trying to mitigate risk. We're trying to mitigate mm -hmm. their cost. We're trying to do a, a test case. We're not trying to say, move your entire budget into this new thing. Let's try this this year. Let's try that. But, you know, to your point, simple changes can have big impacts. And the example you gave of like the blue leash at the dog, at the pet show, yeah. hanging, that's a really good example of what I mentioned earlier of like, that's just borrowing. That's like a visual design cue, right? That's, that's just it. borrowing yep. from yep. the art space. Like yep. that's somebody who probably went to an art exhibit or a museum and saw an installation and was like, Hey, we could take that same idea and just do dog leashes. Yep. And so, you know, I'm kind of a believer and, and this may sound like a negative. I don't personally think of it like that. Like not that there are no original ideas. There are completely original ideas, but they're like, all borrowed. It's all borrowed. Right. Or, yeah, or 98% yeah. of it is borrowed. So that 2% is yeah. going to really stand out. And then yeah. the rest of it is going to be, taking pieces of things you've seen before and, and and turning the dials and reshaping them in a new way. So that's why we look at the art space. That's why we look at music. That's why we look at all these cultural touch points. And also, frankly, why we look overseas, because we're like, if this thing worked in the UK, there's a good chance it's going to work in the US and it might not be done or vice versa. So we're constantly yeah. on the lookout for things that were awesome in one space and can just be reapplied and feel very different and unique and in another space. You know, you said something is interesting there about people just feeling like they just need to get their job done, right? right? So I'm curious, who's your like ideal customer in terms of the actual person at the organization that you're working with? What kind of title do they have? What What's their role that you typically work with? Yeah, we're, we're probably working with like a VP level. That's kind of the sweet spot of somebody who mm -hmm. is senior enough to make decisions they're certainly going to run things up the chain to their boss, but mm -hmm. you know, there's a filter there where they can bring the yeah. right things up the chain and not everything. It also ha maybe has a few years or you know, or some years under their belt where they can recognize a good idea. We can have that kind of higher level competition. You know, the VP is not our day to day necessarily, and sometimes it's an SVP depending. But you know, we're yeah. not in the weeds with a CMO. Like a CMO will mm. come to one of our events, but they're not going to be like, yeah. this couch should be green, not red, you know? And even the VP sometimes isn't at that level. So they're marketing people that you work with. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. Our, almost our entire connection points are in the marketing departments. Senior manager, marketing, all, all, all those spaces. Yeah, totally. And, and yeah, I would okay. say like, for me as the CEO, I want to be having those kind of, hey, let's talk bigger picture. Let's talk the 30,000 foot view with an SVP or a VP. And then my team and, and, and me certainly, because I'm pretty hands-on, are probably going to be in the weeds day to day with call it your director level or senior director or senior manager or something along those lines who are going to be making the thing happen. Because yeah, you know, once the strategy is determined and and for the most part, the creative, which you can look at creative as sort of that idea 
or you could look at creative as like that design. So the almost creative has those two sides as well, but yeah. certainly once the strategy is, is sorted out, you know, you're really more in execution mode. And certainly once the creative design is sorted out, and I'm sure this is the case with you as well, then, then you're just producing, right? Then you're just like, yep. we've made this thing on paper. Now let's go make it in real life to look like what we made on paper. That's the point where, you know, I'm probably less valuable and probably that more senior person, frankly, is, is less valuable. We're just there to like say, yeah, looks good and keep up the good work. Yeah, I think I ask because I find it interesting what you say about just getting the job done. A lot of times in our space, and I'm curious how similar it is to yours, the people that are going out to bid for these big RFPs for trade shows and other stuff, sometimes they're VP level right? But most of the time they're marketing managers, event managers, they've been handed this. They're not fully educated on it. You know, there's not a lot of event marketing training in those spaces. Yeah, and, totally. you know, it, there's a lot of education because they are just concerned with their, they're just trying to get it done and to no fault of their own, right? Yeah, they probably right, have yeah. 10 other things that they have to do. And someone's like, oh, hey, by the way, we have these three trade shows. You know, we spend $600,000. We need you to, you know, we need you to handle this. So it gets yeah, kind of totally. sticky when you start trying to get them to the thing I want to get to here. What you said is about ROI. What kind of measurement are you seeing on brand awareness? Is, is it impressions? Is it the social channels? Is it surveys? Is it what are brands looking for on that consumer side when they do an activation from an ROI standpoint? Yeah, totally. It's a great question. I mean, somewhat, but it's a little bit more, I guess the word I use, or maybe that's commonly used is that like amplification side. So mm, I, I yeah. guess I would almost take it slightly dial back the history a little bit. Cause I think things have changed over the years, like certainly 20 years ago and, and even 10 years ago, I think on the consumer side, IRL events, call them experiences, activations, what have you, whether it's an owned thing that a brand is creating itself or like a presence at a festival or what, whatever, a lot of that ROI was being driven by that in-person connection. And I still think there's a ton of value there, but I think it's, it's harder and harder to justify these huge spends with the number of people that you reach because, you know, IRL is not like a wide net tool. It's not media. It's not a billboard. It's not a, a radio spot or a TV spot or what, or digital. The whole point is to have these kind of more intimate conversations to get a little bit deeper with the, the brand itself. So I think there's there are still instances where the people that you reach in person can justify the spend, but those are your larger events, right? So for, in my world, that's your Comic-Cons, your South Buys, your Super Bowls, maybe a Coachella, you know, like all those events, things yeah. where there's going to be tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people at it anyway. Other than that, though, to get down to your to the question you asked of like what measurement tactics are they looking at? In my space, it's really more of those kind of like amplification. So earned media is a really big one. Earn like just is there press coverage of this? Because that's quantifiable. Social is another one. How many people posted about this, which can be trackable, but can also be hard to track. Like not every consumer who goes to your event is going to post about it with the right hashtag, in which case, how are you yeah, going to find it? But that's a piece of it. And that's where social influencers become so important because they're almost like the earned media side of things. And a lot of those are paid nowadays, but there's still some earned social out there where you can essentially work with an influencer ahead of time to know that they're going to come to your event and whether you pay them or not, you if they're going to post about it, you know what their audience is ahead of time. And partnerships is probably the big third one for us where we're, we're looking at partner channels and who can kind of amplify what we're doing. And sometimes, by the way, our programming partners also become our amplification partners. So an example of that would be like if we're hosting a party and we're going to pay a DJ to come in. Well, we want a DJ that's got a hundred thousand followers, and we might we might be willing to pay more for that DJ because we know that DJ is going to post about it ahead of time or after the fact, and that's another hundred thousand dollars, a hundred thousand followers in our in our bucket. So, and there's yeah. times one of one of the kind of tactics that we've had a lot of success with is really curating our events in partnership with other creators. So. Okay. If you think about, let's call it a party, right? There's got to be somebody doing the food. 
That could be a caterer. It could be a celebrity chef. Somebody going to be spinning music or a band playing. That could be a regular DJ or a celebrity DJ. Mm-hmm. Obviously, these things cost more money, but you can have a, a somebody designing the space, who's performing at the space, who's mm-hmm. is there an artist doing a kick-ass mural in the corner live? Well, that's cool for your on-site experience, but it's also helpful because the artist might have a following that they can post about. So, yeah. one of the things that we will we'll look to do is like try to get as many different people, entities, organizations, whatever, in bed with us ahead of time so that before this event ever happens, we know we've got a certain return in the social space. Yeah. And then everything on top of that is 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 gravy, essentially. That makes sense. That really does. It's interesting, the shift, right? You're saying how like the reach used to be the in-person reach. Now it's the digital reach amplification after the fact. It's kind of like how content is king, right? So you're using an event events, values, and things have changed slightly. They're still valuable. They'll still happen. I think there needs to be more meaningful connection at them. It needs to be more engaging. You can't just have the event to have it, but you got to be creating content and creating that, what you're saying, amplification piece for afterwards and during per se. And having- Yeah, for sure. And and there's events that we do, by the way, that only exist for the content, you know? Um, And usually that's like a video output of some kind. Again, I would say there though, who's pushing it out other than the brand? I mean, sometimes the brand's big enough, your client might be big enough, but like yep. we're always looking for other spaces because they can post post on their own organic or their own, excuse me, social content anytime they want. Now, yeah. maybe if we create something that's awesome, it's going to be better social content than something else they would have done. But the goal hopefully is that there's other people who are willing to cover it because the content itself is so compelling or unique or what have you. And that's, yeah, it's a really good point, again, especially in that video capture space. And I think, you know, in our world, again, because we do so much in the TV space and there is that kind of, like sports, for example, there's that built-in fandom, you know, that Mm -hmm. whole idea of FOMO is something that we can really tap into. So some of the time that we're creating these events half of the output is fans sharing and then other fans saying, oh my God, I wish I could have gone to that. That's so awesome. Like there's actually a ton of value in the people who didn't go, who wanted to attend, who couldn't attend or didn't know, you know, hopefully they knew about it. But the the point being like, you can really push people's buttons in that way. And so that's, that's another kind of trigger that we try to pull in terms of if we're engaging a fan base it's not just the people who attend. It's that kind of like yearning of people who, who didn't get to attend is, is there's, you know, there's value there as well. Tell me about, we were talking earlier and I really like what you said about creative having two sections, right? Idea and design. I think of ideas as like cool ideas, concepts, themes, narrative, story, all those things. And then I think of design is sort of like having all your ducks in a row and then creating from a foundation where you feel like you have some kind of direction. So tell me a little bit about those two pieces. Yeah. I mean, I think they work hand in hand, but that's how we think of it. So the first one, the idea side of things, you know, we, we typically call creative strategy, which is just, you know, basically meaning thinking about the results, thinking about the ROI, thinking about the ideas, borrowing from those other spaces. It's really that kind of like whiteboard moment where you're kind of like brainstorming, right? No idea is a bad idea. And you're really, the goal is to come out with a concept, but there's a lot of inputs that go into that concept and, and, and kind of what makes a good idea. The other side from our world, certainly because we're doing events is the creative design. So that's very much your visuals. How does it look Within that, you know, we kind of look at 3D and 2D separately. So 2D is your graphics, your signage, all that. 3D is your kind of environmental design. So there's there's quite a bit of synergy between the two, but it it really is an A then B, at least in our world. Like the creative mm-hmm. strategy is the first part. And then once that kind of has been locked in, then our, des- our actual designers, and that's more of an art direction thing kind of go to town. You know, one thing that's kind of interesting or like how we like to think about the ideation process in that creative strategy side of it is, again, we start with ROI. I know I said that a couple of times, but like we try to like, the the word we use is like reverse engineering. Like we try to look at what we want to accomplish and then work backwards. 
And obviously coming up with something cool and original has to be a part of that. But starting with the result is a pretty good way to know that you're going to finish with the results you want. You know, a lot of, I think a lot of agencies start with cool. Let's put it that way, right? They go like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if, which is great. You need to be cool. You need to be clever. You need to be breakthrough. You need to be original, all of those things. But you also need to be pointing and pushing towards a result. Cool for the sake of cool might not get the pickup you need. It might not get the social traction you need. It might not get the butts and seats you need, whatever it might be. Yeah. So that's that's kind of how we approach the kind of creative strategy side. And then, and, you know, and then the art side is kind of is a little bit more traditional, right? It's it just depends on the day. There might be if we're building, literally fabbing something. There, we're probably going to work with a fabrication partner. There might be architectural plans. There might be engineering approvals. You know, obviously all all the nuts and bolts of events, right? Is it over a certain height? Then we need to go to the city for approval. All those things that everybody kind of get can get in the weeds on. But you know, we've got a full team, and then obviously we work out of house because sometimes the 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 best people, particularly on the execution side are groups like yourselves who are in the weeds every day, designing, building, fabbing, all that awesome mm-hmm. stuff, which, you know, hopefully if we do our jobs correctly, we're stronger in the creative yeah. strategy side of things. Yeah. Um, we could certainly execute an event, but there's lots of partners I think that we could bring in to help us do that. Yeah, man. I mean, we even outsource some of our fabrication when it gets into some of the bigger, cooler stuff. You know, when you start talking about like, you know, making things from foam and, and, and all yeah, totally. cool, you know, like, so some of that stuff's even outside of, of, of our stretch as a company that does a lot of that work. I thought it was interesting. I I've always long thought this we've worked with agencies on our side with agencies who come to us to build their client, a trade show booth or work on an activation. And then I also know my industry, the trade show and event industry. I've long thought agencies swing and miss just because they're designing cool. Right. And then the event in the trade show world has gotten locked into design without the idea, without the strategy, without the intention, right? So it's kind of two totally different worlds. So when you're saying things like, you know, you have to do A before B, that strategy, the idea, and really what I heard you say was to begin with the end in mind. What are you looking to achieve? To me, that's just like, no matter whether you're a trade show company, an event company, an activation company, an experiential company, uh, whatever in our space, you need to do A before B, right? Or you just need to be B or say you just need to be C that's fabricating and you need to just be excellent at it, right? But if you're going to do a little bit of both, if you're going to do A and B idea and design, the idea has to come first. So I really like that you said that because I think it's important. Can you tell me a little bit about your process in that idea phase. Yeah, sure. And by the way, one note, just I, I, I want to answer your question, but before I lose my thought, like what's also interesting about what we just said is going back to your note earlier, sometimes the client doesn't know, you know, yeah, of like course. you can yeah. ask all the right questions, but mm-hmm. sometimes the client doesn't have the answer or sometimes you're talking to the wrong person. And yep. that can be very tricky because if you're talking mm-hmm. to somebody who's inherited a brief and their job is just to like collect bids and you're asking them really high level questions about their goals and why are they trying to accomplish this and they're not giving you the right answers or you your spidey senses go off and go this person doesn't know the answers that's very tricky because if they don't know then you're certainly not going to know and you're like well should we go around their back and go to their boss probably not that's not a good look to win the bid right so never no (laughs) how how you dialogue with your clients is like a you know, a whole, you can teach a masterclass on it, but, but yeah, just to kind of go back to your, your direct question of what is our process? Yeah. I mean, I do think we try to start with that kind of reverse engineering, right. Starting with the result. We try to look at similar things that have been done in my world, because each show, again, we do so much in the TV space that we're, we're often ideating around Well, we are always ideating around a specific TV show. Those, those shows have their own worlds, right? So if it's a Western, everyone knows what a Western looks like, right? There's guns, there's spurs, there's cowboys, whatever. Totally different from a sci-fi show, totally different from like a procedural or a law drama, whatever. So we've got tangible nuggets to start with. And so how I try to do it is very much like an analytical approach. I try to, rather than starting with 
like, okay, everyone just start throwing stuff at the wall. I'll try to start by like list generating. That's kind of my process. So I don't know. I'm totally making this up. I'm, let's say it's a pirate show. I don't know why I picked a pirate yep. show, but say it's a pirate show. Okay. So I'm going to start with a list of everything that everybody knows already about pirates. And you can research that. You can mm -hmm. go to Google and say things associated with pirates. Uh, there's a parrot, there's like an eye patch, peg leg Pete, whatever. You can come up with a list of 50 things. Then I'm going to come up with a list of tactics that I think are going to achieve our goals. Maybe it's a stunt, maybe it's a party, maybe it's a fidgetal execution, maybe it's a sweepstakes, and there's going to be 50 things in there, give or take. Maybe it's 20, maybe it's more. And then we're going to start to draw lines between the two, right? And that is where the like mm, creative yeah. light bulb moments yep. start. And that's where you'll start to say, oh, that doesn't make sense, but this would be cool. Or could we do this? Is that even physically possible? Or, oh, I saw, I saw this art exhibit where they manipulated light in this way. Would that make sense? Like those are the kind of moments, but generally speaking, I try to do that upfront work. And, and if I'm running a brainstorm, which I, I usually am, I'll make my own little brief ahead of time. I'll take the client's brief and I'll try to sort through the things that are really important. And I'll try to cut out the things that aren't. And then I'll try to put my own kind of unique take on it. And then I'll generate those lists so that when we come to a brainstorm, instead of seeing a big white, like a big white board is scary to me. Like yeah. a big white board is like getting in your car for a road trip without a map and be like, well, where do you want to go? So yeah. if we have that work done ahead of time, then the first thing is like, let's draw, start drawing some connections or Let's focus on this space. We know within our pirate show that our characters are lost at sea. Let's talk about what it means to be lost at sea. Do any of these tactics make sense um, yeah. for that specific theme? And if it's not working, we'll say, great, we're moving on to the next. But, you know, having structure to your ideation process is extremely important. And, you know, it's so funny. This is not stuff that they teach you in, in anywhere, really. You know, it's no. just like on the job training. It's like, yep. I don't know if my style is better than anyone else's. I know that it seems to work for us and it just was crafted over 20 years of like trying different things. Another thing just, you know, where the rubber meets the road, I would say is like, I'll often give assignments to people ahead of the brainstorm. So every person that comes mm. in, it's like, I want you to, I want you to think about these three things. I want you to think about these three things. I want you to think about these yeah. three things. And each of you come up or, or each of you come to the table with two ideas. So yep. that we're starting reacting to something. We're starting in the middle. We're not starting from state phase one. That's yeah. another kind of nugget I think that's really important. And then again, rubber meets the road, but I think this is really important. I think the, the number of people in the brainstorm is more important than how creative the people are. I think creative, I think lots of people can actually be more creative than they think they are. But like the second you exceed, for me, that magic number is like four or five. If you've got six people in a brainstorm, seven, eight, I, I'm just like, it's just too much. I would just yeah. say, great, cool. Divide into two groups of four, you know? It's too many. Yeah. Yeah. It's too many people because people are talking over each other and it just gets to be too many cooks in the kitchen. So I don't know. Those are some of the nuggets that of, of our process. I think the idea of having those two lists is really good. Like, hey, just a list. You're just saying like, hey, let's just like, let's chat GBT this thing, right? Like, let's just start with anything that comes up that's on this topic or in, in this world, this space. I mean, you could do it for anything, B2B, B2C. If it's a medical company, you could talk totally. about, okay, knee replacements. Okay, knee replacements. What goes in, what's involved in knee replacements and the doctors, you could just list it. And then going to the idea of like tactics and engagements and then uh, like, the term you use connecting the dots is interesting to me because essentially at an event and what a lot of brands are trying to do is connect the dots is help their customer connect the dots. Right. Yeah. So you're kind of telling a story there. We do it a little bit differently, but similar esque on, on our side. So it's, it's interesting to see how people do it to be able to sort of push in a direction that they can then, you know, then go create from. So very interesting. Yeah. And I also think it's a question of like, what do you want to deliver to your client? Right. Um, mm -hmm. Some, in some worlds, I would think more so yours, like you're getting, 
you probably have a certain parameters that you need to work with him, right? If someone says, design me a trade show booth and you come back and you're like, I didn't do a trade show booth, but I did this awesome thing at the hotel for people that might be like, cool, that's not the yeah. assignment. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> yeah. So it's like, yeah. how how wide do you want to go? How wild, I suppose, do you want to go? And also like, how many ideas do you want? You know, what we tend to do because we live in a world of best idea wins every time, we tend to give a lot of ideas, pretty high level. A lot of them are one slide each, maybe it's two slides, but probably more than our competition. Like I, I, it's not unheard of for us to deliver eight, 10, 12 ideas. That's a lot. That's yeah. a lot of ideas. Yeah. For someone so, to yeah, that's a good and I'm very, very thoughtful about where, where did we lose them? Like, what's the point in this hour long presentation where they go, uncle, they slipped off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, these are all yeah, great ideas, tell. but now there are too many and I just can't focus on the one I like. And it's our job to pump close to that edge, but not to go over it, right? Yeah. Some people deliver three ideas and they bake them out more. Some people deliver one mm-hmm. idea and they go, here's your plan. And I've thought through it from A to Z. So yeah, none of those are right or wrong. It's just a question of like, who's your client? What do they want? What are they going to respond to? You know, it's not the right same answer every time. We, I was literally having this discussion yesterday with my creative director. We we're talking about it's a bid, right? Very, very large brand, super well known for their trade show program. And he, you know, we were kind of having this discussion as to we were creating this engagement idea. It's like a digital interactive engagement, right? For there. And he's kind of going down the path of like building it out a little bit. Cause he wants to present like a teaser yeah. because, he, but he's so invested in thinking it's a good idea, you know? So it's like what you're saying, you could just pitch it along with three, four other ideas along that space or in the engagement area, or you could go all in on one or two things. It's, it does depend on the customer. It depends what they're looking for, what they're trying to accomplish all of those, all of those things. But I'll tell you what best idea typically wins. Well, yeah. And you know, I didn't, it's funny. I was always jealous of what I think one of the ways, one of the tricks, I guess, is to turn the paper in early. Right. I, and I was going to say, I joke because I wasn't necessarily the best student in college or, yeah, you know, yeah. I was always jealous of the people that had their stuff together enough to like write a paper hand it in a week early, let the client or let the, excuse me, let the teacher, the professor yeah. mark it up. Then they went back and like, you're pretty much going to get an A at that point. Cause you already, yeah. like you've already gotten the, yeah. the, the negative feedback. So I, there is that, you know, that whole tissue session idea. I think that's a very underutilized tool. I think if your clients are willing to get them on the phone, ask for a small amount of time. Don't ask for an hour, 15 minutes or whatever. Say, Hey, I'm going to throw a bunch of things at you. I want to see how it hits your ear. All the better if you can be on like a zoom call where you can literally see them and see the reaction. Cause sometimes what they say and, and is, is not as telling as how their body reacts, yeah. Yeah. but that can save so much time. Right. Cause then your designer can say, Hey, I know I'm onto something here. Let's go all in or, yep. Yeah, let's stay a little high level. They don't, they clearly don't know what they want. So let's not go deep on any one thing. And then, you know, visuals, obviously pictures worth a thousand words. So I'm sure you guys have that kind of challenge all the time of like, what do we show? How deep do we give, how deep do oh, yeah. we, how, how much design do we give them in the pitch phase? Yep. Since yep. that's ultimately what we're being hired for. Yeah, that's a, God, that's an age old argument too. When it comes right. to how much time do you put into 3D design, rendering, touching up, we've really gotten into like sketching stuff, honestly, like concept, like like conceptual ideas before we ever go into rendering phases. Because I'm just a believer in kind of the things we're talking about that the idea is what wins. They just need something visual. If you don't pitch an idea and you just show a sketch or a design, nobody cares, right? You might as well just do the design. But if you pitch an idea or a concept or a theme or a story, and then you give a little bit of a sketch that goes with it, yeah. you're now telling them a story. And then you can hold off on having to spend 12 hours in 3D Max or whatever it is that you're using to create something. But the I feel like the process is almost always better when done in those steps, in those phases, because you're kind of getting your client along for the ride to buy into the idea. And some brands just have very strict guidelines. I mean, the bigger the brand, sometimes the more strict and the less willing they are to take big risks or do fun, cool, crazy 
stuff. So you have to work within those parameters, which makes the pitching process unique at times. Yeah, totally. No, but I, I'm right with you. I think that process makes a ton of sense, getting buy-in from the client. And again, most agencies aren't even going to think to call the client ahead of time and say, hey, do you have 20 minutes to hop on a phone? Like that alone is going to separate oh. you from most of your competitors yeah. and it's free. And if they say no, who cares? Even if they say no, they know you care more than the guy who didn't yeah. ask, you know? So I yeah. think that, that alone is like a great first step. We're kind of to the point now for us. I mean, we don't bid unless they get on the phone. Yeah. You send us an RFP. I don't care if it's a million dollars. If you won't have a conversation about it, we just don't want to bid on it because how can you really truly understand? I know they're going to tell you it's all in the RFP. I get it. I know it's all there, right? But to develop a relationship and to be able to ask good, like, how do you know? And I did a whole episode on this, on how to do an RFP. It's like, you're just going to send an RFP out. How do you know the difference between the people that you're RFPing to, right? And if you ask somebody, they'll typically say, oh, you know, whoever comes back with the best pitch. And I said, well, what about the process? Mm -hmm. What about the process they take you through? Because from my understanding, I think the best company is the company that takes you through the best process. So if you've ever been sold anything in your life, typically yeah. the best salesperson takes you through a best process and they build trust every step of the way. And you're like, you know, you're halfway through, you're like, this is, this is a really good process. I'm hundred percent going to buy this. Yeah, totally. Uh, totally. No, you know? I I'm, I'm with you. I mean, it's so, there's so many nuances. And again, it's just like on the job training. Like you just got to get those reps in, you know, we, we talk about that a lot. Like it's, it's similar to going to the gym. Like you just have at a certain point, you just have to put up the pounds again and again. Yeah, you got to go. See the mm -hmm. results. But totally, I think, listen, clients who are not willing to get on the phone, I think that's very telling. And, 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 and mostly I think what it comes down to is that it is a two-way street, right? Like if a client thinks about it of, well, we're the client, we're the one paying, so we don't need to do anything and they're just going to do all the work for us, then they're, unfortunately, they're not, A, they're not going to be a great client and B they're at a they're at a disadvantage because they're not making the be, the most use out of their agencies that are willing to do this work for them in the pitch yeah. phase. it is work right and usually it's free yeah. sometimes i don't know if your world you get paid to pitch sometimes people get paid sometimes they don't but you know i think that i think that it's it, it's just a question of the more work they're willing to do the more they're going to put in the more they're going to get out of it and also yeah. as an agency such as yourself if somebody's not willing to do the work, call it, get on the phone or whatever else it might yeah. be, it's probably a red flag. And, and a lot of yep. times, by the way, I'll have, yeah. when I get on the phone, I'll have my questions about the themes and the, what do they mm -hmm. want to get out? The really high level stuff. I'll have questions about some of the more tactical things. And then I'll have a, bu a bucket of questions about the bid. How many agencies are bidding? Mm -hmm. That's oh, always a yeah. question I ask. Is there an incumbent? Have you ever worked with one of these agencies of before? So. Mm -hmm. How, you know, sometimes you go, okay, this is a BS bid. They're bidding this out because yep. they have to. Oh yeah. We've mm -hmm. worked with the same agency for five years in a row. Great. And we like really want to bid yep. on that, yeah. you know? So yeah. asking those right questions and having the opportunity to ask those questions is really, really important. And it's harder when you start out, you're probably going to bid on more stuff because you're a, yeah. you know, a new agency, but over time, you know, that, that stuff becomes more important and hopefully knock on wood, you get to a point where you're not bidding where people are bidding on you, you know, that people are coming to you because you have the reputation and you're vetting yeah. the clients as much as they're vetting you. That's where you really like start to shine because then you can, you know, the people you want to work with and then you're you mm -hmm. know, working yeah. with the same people again. And then you're in a groove. You know, I've always had this like long running joke with my sales team. I always say like, like the reason that people send RFPs to 15 companies is because seven don't even respond. And then right. of the seven that do respond, only three end up bidding or four. And that's what somebody would want. That makes sense. If someone said to me, hey, you know, we're bidding out a half million dollar activation or a half million dollar trade show booth or something. I don't expect them to bid it to two people. I just don't, right? Three is, three is fair. Four is fair. Honestly, I have no problem with that. As long as there's not some strong incumbent that you have to shop them, then I, you, you know, I really don't want to part in it. But it's like, it's kind of created this over time where just put ourselves in our client's shoes. 
right? You send out this RFP because people are like, well, you know, you're going to send it to 15, but you're only going to get seven to respond. And then this many is going to bid. It's kind of turned into this really weird, really weird game. Well, I would guess, I would say, you know, putting ourselves in the role of the client, how many bids do you want to view? You know what I mean? Like Ugh, yeah. if they've done their job right and they've selected a good crew of people, I can't imagine wanting to go through more than call it five ballpark, you know, dart at the wall, five, right? Three, six, whatever. I, who the hell wants to go through 15 bits? Especially some of these wanna... decks. Have you seen some of these decks that get sent out? Well, I, I, no, I no, I mean, that, and that's the thing. I'm, we've got the sizes where... of them. What'd you say? The, the, the sizes of these decks that get sent out, the garbage that's inside of them, page after page after page. It's like, get, get to the point. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I don't need a hundred page deck. What, yeah. what could I possibly need a hundred page deck for? I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I always think that like, no, we, I think, I think so. Them. I think that there's com you, you seem more confident when you can say more with less, yep. probably you want to establish some credibility up front, but then you want to get to the good stuff quickly. But, you yeah. know, thinking as you're putting a bid together and I don't, I don't mean you personally, like anyone, I think it's, yeah. The idea of what, what would I want to receive? Well, I'd want to, I'd want to know I have a great group who can do it is, has a proven track record. I'd want to know what this awesome idea was, why they were different. I would probably want to know something about the pricing. So I knew I wasn't getting really excited about, it. I had an idea I couldn't afford. Yep. And then if it were me, I'd want to get on the phone with the people and, you mm -hmm. know, it's like buying a car. I don't want to look at 15 cars. I want to look at four cars. I know oh, geez. Fit yeah. my family yeah. or my life or whatever. Yeah. In line with that, what kind of advice would you have for say a marketer or an event marketer working for company brand that is doing trade shows, events, activations, anything in that live space, right? And they want to get more experiential. They want to start to, you know, push that direction, get more creative, get more engaging. What kind of advice would you have for them? Where do they start? What do they do? What kind of questions do they ask? What, what should their thinking be like? Well, the first thing I'd say is you should call Rob Drury or Cartwheel and Co. And then all your <laughs> all your dreams will come true. <laughs> yeah. No, um, you know, I think there's enough out there today that I would just start with looking at some like similar projects and programs mm -hmm. to get a sense of what the market what what exists, and then probably getting on the phone with some people and being upfront and saying. Hey, I saw your work. This uh, by people, I really mean agencies. I mean, look, if you've got a yeah. friend in the industry who you can talk to, great. You, if you you can go client to client and say, "Hey, I'm trying to get into this. Tell me more about your experience." But I think, like anything else, it's just asking a lot of questions of people that you know or people that you don't know, but that you you come to trust. So, if they were calling agencies, for example, I think it would be being upfront. Hey, I'm, we're looking to get into this. Here's what we're kind of thinking. We don't have a budget carved out for it, or we do have a budget carved out for it, or this is the, wow. my boss is super hyped on this, or no one's hyped on this, but I think it's a good idea. You know, just whatever the lay of the land is. And then saying like, what sorts of stuff do you think would make sense? Because I think when you start with that, you're, you're immediately starting in that sort of strategy space that we talked about, which is where you want to be anyway. You know, if it's if it's just like, hey, I've got an event I've got to do, and I need a, an executional partner, I'd say probably ask people around you who are who are trusted partners to work with, or yeah. go to you know go to event marketer, go to BizBash, go to some of these resources. I'm sure there's specific resources in your world where there's you know lists of agencies, but you know, and and awards. I guess if people have won awards, I don't I don't know that I put a ton of stock into that because I think there's great people out there who have. <laughs> Never won awards. I say that as somebody who just won an award, and I'm like, if we weren't any better before uh, or after we won it. We just happened to win this one. But so I really like what you said when it comes to that market or that person that's looking to kind of push in like a different direction. Is sometimes it's difficult for them to be vulnerable if they don't know what they're doing. It's yeah. difficult for them to say, "Hey, we've always done this, and I'd like to do this, but I'm not sure how." Like it's a very challenging thing for them to do. But yeah. I just would like. I would encourage if you're a marketer, if you're an event marketer, if if you're bidding out to companies like Rob's, like mine, like other creative people, just do your research before you ever talk to us. Like do as much research as you can with content, our websites, our projects, everything. And then when you think you found a couple good companies, 
go to them. And if you're looking for something, just say what it is that you're looking for or what you don't know how to do. Because typically a good company will take you through a very good process and will kind of wrap you up and say, hey, look, no problem. Like, yeah, you don't need to know that stuff. We know how to do that stuff. Let us show you. And if a company like Rob's, like mine, if we have good process and we're explaining things to you the right way, it'll really start to make sense. And you can end up with a partner that can get you over that hump and really get you doing cool stuff, I think. Yeah, hundred percent. I would agree with you. And, you know, there's plenty of people such as myself and you who are willing to have those conversations with people that are serious, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. obviously it's, it's, I think being upfront with people, this is generally speaking, you know, business and, and otherwise, is this the simplest and most effective way to go? And I certainly would be fine if somebody said, Hey, I'm thinking of doing this. I don't know if it makes sense for us. Can do you have 20 minutes? Do you have half an hour? No problem. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And I think to your point, the right groups will very quickly be able to say, Hey, this makes sense for you, or it doesn't, or here's the process that we can talk you through to help figure out what the best step is. Nice. Well, Rob, I appreciate you coming on the show, man. I really, I enjoyed our conversation on the comparison to kind of B2C, B2B, you know, the experiential side of things, the ideation, you know, kind of how this, this cool stuff kind of comes to light. And then I really enjoyed kind of your thoughts on like ROI and amplification and some of the changes that are going on when people are putting on these events. So thanks for coming on. Thanks for sharing some of that knowledge. Yeah, likewise. This was this has been a ton of fun. Thank you for having me and really enjoyed the conversation. It's great to see a little bit of the other side of things. And yeah, hopefully your audience got got some something cool out of this and, and really appreciate it. Awesome. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. That's another episode of Event Marketing Redefined. We will see you soon. And as always, thanks for tuning in.